this article of explained that were agreed upon, instead of CO2 emissions, like we had that in, in some other reports, the only reason was that, that we cannot afford more than two degrees, I'm talking Celsius now, 0.8 Celsius is where we are today. And we cannot afford more than two degrees of temperature increase. So that will have impact that we can predict or we can fight back. It's talking super everything, it's talking meltdown, it's talking about many other things that we can't even predict. So they said that we should stop at two degrees Celsius. We must look at everything that we do to make sure that we don't go beyond that point. Now this article tells us that they tried to calculate the CO2 which caused this 0.8 degree increase. And it comes up some some ginormous numbers, 500 and some odd thousand gigatons or whatnot. It's a huge number. But that's not the important part. He says, okay, if this is 0.8, then we know what two points is. I mean, two, two degrees will be. And he comes up with 2,700 uh, you know, gigatons of CO2 equivalent. And he says, and that's the problem. Because if you look at the known reserves of uh, oil, gas, carbon, all those things are way past that. And the companies who are mining those, who are providing those, have absolutely no intention of slowing down or even looking at this number. And he, he just goes over, if you only take so much from, you know, the two biggest companies, you're already almost there. So it's, it's a pretty brutal math that we look at it. And when you when you compare that to the ignorance of, of the government and everybody else, how they deal with it, it's appalling. So at least as, as, as long as you guys are aware of this and you, you understand it, and you can explain it to, to your peers and to your uh, co-workers and team, it's, it's a great thing. That's why green is not a building type. It's a movement. It's all coming from our minds that we know what can be done and what should be done. One more item. <clears throat> I think it was in the same article that it compares CO2 to cigarettes. Uh, and it says cigarettes were for a long time ignored by government and nobody put any uh, uh, restrictions on it. But if you look at a cigarette, a pack of cigarettes today, you see a call and cross on that. And they tell you, you will die if you, if you use this product. So you've got a government warning. Now there's a shocking, you know, step too, because we should have those same call it a crossbow sign, not gas station. Because the evidence shows that we are slowly killing ourselves up of this planet. And I'm, <clears throat> I just have a rhetorical question for you guys. We call ourselves the intelligent species of this planet, correct? <clears throat> we are the superior, we are the top, top of the line, top of the food chain, so to speak. I'll give you a scenario. I always like to do, I read a lot of science fiction books because they get you out of your um, normal environment, which means a different environment, and test your your responses to the things that you would respond to differently given that you stay in your own environment. So let's say aliens land on this planet long from now. And we all, you know, disappeared, and there's no more uh, human race on Earth. 
and they would start digging and finding, you know, bones and things and, and figure out that there was a great civilization here. Now my question to you guys, would they call us intelligent if only what we could achieve is killing ourselves off the planet? I just would yours to answer. No. Yes. Um, I, I haven't sent this to anybody. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm saying that it's highly politically charged, and I wanted to make sure that I can explain that I have no intention on the political side. I always say neutral, so should you. However, your action should be the right one to, to get to the result. And the result is the green building and the elimination of carbon and using less of energy. That's the case. Yeah. And then my other question was, uh, with the CO2 that's being emitted into the air, in relation to when we first started walking, it's an expansion of a certain percentage, and it's, it has it as a percentage of the CO2 that's being back into oxygen that's affecting the atmosphere as well. Um, we call it a greenhouse, yeah. And maybe, maybe I need to. <coughs> there are many different greenhouses, yeah. CO2 is one of them. Methane is one. Um, these are the, and, and all of our refrigerants, basically. That's, that's the kind of thing. Because they all uh, capture and tie down ozone molecules that are protecting us from. from uh, I, I mentioned that last time that for the first year that the ozone layer is healing itself because we, we put uh, a ban on the uh, freon and we started phasing down all those that per molecule. You know, this, um, each molecule of these, these refrigerants can destroy thousands of molecules of ozone. These are the ones we have to stop making and start going to the direction where we have kind of neutral products in our in our cooling system. The problem is it's it's very hard to find anything that is capable of carrying the amount of energy, or taking away the amount of energy we need to, and still be you know, friendly to the environment. Because we're, we're looking at supercharged products, and they just they just don't exist in nature. So we need to make sure that we keep them safe and, and so on and so forth. The answer to the question: the greenhouse gases are also having another impact. That there are increased quantities in the air that prevent the natural cool down of the air. What normally would happen? Daytime, when the sun hits the earth, the surface, it absorbs the heat. It kind of what we talked about the heat side of the sun. And then when the, uh, when the planet turns to the night side, it would radiate back into the space. Now, the greenhouse gases create a blanket that reflects the heat back onto the earth's surface. It doesn't allow them to go through the uh, atmosphere, which is charged with a lot of CO2. So now you have a blanket over the Earth, and the natural cooling off of the Earth does not happen. That's why we have the uh, massive you know, heating of the Earth. And the more CO2 you put into it, the blanket just gets thicker and thicker. It's not really a blanket because it's dispersed in the air, but every time when, when uh, the heat um, tries to escape, it's going to hit one of those molecules and reflect back in. Yeah. So that, that's a really basic uh, way of trying to explain what the greenhouse gas is like and what they do. And they call it greenhouse gas because this is what we do when we, uh, when we try to plant uh, in colder climates. We try to create a little greenhouse where we capture all the heat and make sure the laws reflect back in. So that's, that's the uh, analogy.
kind of, it's, it's not really a news flash, but I wonder if you all hear this. There is a call for ownership, internship application. If you haven't seen it and you're interested in it, please let me know. This is, uh, we're going to be talking very, very timely because we're going to be talking about water today and watersheds. So uh, if you're interested in this, take a look see. There's a, uh, an email from Nebra uh, uh, Mangum. He, uh, he wants to know if you guys are interested in this. Um, again, what's involved is um, several principles that you can see. And if you're interested in either one of them, throw uh, together a little bit of an uh, application. And they're, they're, they're looking for people to, uh, to engage in this field. Is anyone interested to talk to that? When was the intern of Indian Brown Um, I haven't read all the, uh, partial pieces, but if you're interested, I'll send you guys the, uh, the, uh, yeah. the board of Indian, okay? How about that? Thank you. Yeah, well, you can analyze it and look into it, but it really is, um, in, in, the same line as, as we're talking about green buildings, but it's, it's mostly agriculture. Okay? So, uh, that will be going out to you. <coughs> so, no other news flash? There are some newcomers. I want to make sure that I ask everybody. <coughs> Anything else? That's a cost. I've read uh, an article about batteries coming out. We were one of the There's a follow-up article which is coming out, and I'm waiting for that until I get through the sales of that. Besides the free as part of the energy section, and today we do water. Um, the homework. Almost everybody has homework done, which is pretty nice. And moreover, they're, they're getting very interested. So thank you for your attention. A um, few things you missed from my email, I said put in your link to that particular uh, building. Ooh, not a big deal for you to find it. Uh, and it was okay. There is a problem with the email on some of you. What I did was, today I asked you guys to sign this form, and you see your email on the side, if there is a typo in there, please let me know because that's what I'm using. Okay. I received an email this morning for sending it back. And then also the, the attendance, I have a why if you were here. If there is a, an issue, let me know, uh, I will look at the signage. A few things from before. Somebody, I'm trying to be made, but I made somebody. Somebody brought up the terminology, the Jerry scheme, which is X D R I S C. It's um, in the initial phases of, of uh, irrigation design. Somebody came up with this concept. It's a zero water irrigation concept. So uh, zero escape is its word for it today. Zero escape is actually a patented name by one of the landscape architects. So uh, when you use it, be aware of it that you want. you're violating a patent. So call it zero escape or zero water. Uh, this is a great concept, no, nothing wrong with it, and nothing wrong with patenting anything. Uh, it's kind of an odd thing. But I don't know how it happens. And I have somebody who wrote about uh, World Green Building Council. Uh, World uh, Green Building and effects of World Green Building, which is great. So we are looking at the uh, uh, what was the homework? Anyone? 
becoming very important that we, we don't just guess and, and assume for the looking to scientists and having that. Again, one of the issues, as I brought up uh, early on the USGBC, precautionary principle, which I summed up as do no harm. So when in doubt, that something is, is harmful, do not use it. Don't wait until scientific evidence shows that, yes, a township was killed off because of this crop. On the very first um, session, I was talking about the book. I don't know if you guys remember the, uh, the book. It was written by um, a lady who was actually called the, uh, the one who started the whole you know, scientific evidence and start buying the uh, chemicals. Rachel Carson. The silence principle is high. Have you guys read it? Very interesting book. It's about uh, chemicals that were used very, very wide uh, spread. DDT. You guys are familiar with the agreements uh, from DDT? It was a pesticide, and what was the problem with DDT? And can somebody remember you in death fly into it? What happens with most of the chemicals that we throw in the air or throw in the field? And so the 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 predators, right? the predators, well, the problem is that we throw in more and more and year over year, so it accumulates. What was the book called in the Silent Spring. Di Dichlor, dichlorodichlorodichlorodichlorodichlorodichlorodichlorodichlorodichlorodichlorodichlorodichlorodichlorodichlorodichlorodichlorodichlorodichlorodichlorodichlorodichlorodichlorodichlorodichlorodichlor
Most of the shells were very easy to see reproduce. We're going to go into that on toxicology as well. A lot of impact, basically, on, on, on just one single thing we came up with, thinking everything was something good, something useful for our, our agriculture. And again, you really have to go back to the precautionary principle. You have to prove it that it's just okay before you apply it. And again, we are still doing the same thing with a lot of other, you know, oil and oil sand and all those things, we don't know what the, the amount of harm is caused by taking those out. Uh, we're jumping on it because it's not in, the, not in the place where you have to put an army for it to protect the people. So it's, uh, it's unfortunate, but that's, that's the problem. I want to make sure you guys know about this book. This was really, um, she was a pioneer the chemical industry that had her. They stripped her PhD, it made her, they ridiculed her, it made her a, a, a poor uh, individual who impoverished her to uh, the land. And it was, it was disgusting how, you know, the whole industry came down to one person who was speaking the truth, as we know today. Because I think I just put this out. Um, we have a new initiative that finally the California legislature is checking for the electric cars. And uh, I don't know, not, not that it did happen, obviously, we're, we're following too. This is the problem with you know, that thing being political. Why something has to be obvious before our legislature uh, kind of serves it and, and puts a law into it? This law existed in late 90s. We're talking about you know, bringing in electric cars, and that's why the who killed the electric car uh, issue came up. That you know we have the two billion dollar program. By GM, and they scrapped it. So now, now it's just it's coming out of the grave and and you know, and being well right now. So kind of interesting how how things go in the cycle. When there is no more oil, I don't know. Do we have to legislate that there is no more oil? You know, a lot of the capitalism in general has caused it. To just say that a big day went out of it or maybe it's being elected, it's going to stand for them and I think it's going to be clear. That's true. That's true. Um, one thing I, I, uh, I don't know if you guys ever thought about this. This country is big, just hundreds of millions of people. In order to heat up and in order to uh, get clothes on us at a very low amount. In order to have buildings like this and, and lighting, everything has to be mass produced. So what's the problem with mass production? Once you put a factory together that is producing for 100 million, that factory is not going to be this big. It's going to be huge. It's going to be large. It's probably going to be several factories all over the country. And when you tool the factory, you know, furbish it to do what it's supposed to do, produce the, the, the goods, that's a huge hinder. There's a lot of money going Bank, government, everybody takes a hand. Now we start making something. But there's an ROI on everything, a return on investment, which rules. And the rule is, until you pay that money back, you're going to make a penny. You've got to pay it back. Well, you do make a little bit, but you've got to pay it back with interest. So when we, when we do those things and make things cheap for everybody to have, 
then you sign basically a 15-year uh, product cycle. You have to produce the same thing for 15 years or, or 10 years. I don't know if that probably is different for every product. So this becomes a parade for innovation. Because you can't have your case and easy too. You can't have mass producing factories and turn them on a dime when something better comes up. So this is the, the thing that our industry, and you guys are mechanical engineers, most of you know, you do something, well, not everything, okay? You need to work on the mind. But the problem is, we need to look at this as a fact, and we need to figure out a way how to make factories that can turn on the dime. And today's factories are different from the ones we have built in the future. But this concept is really running through even today. Because it's true. <coughs> it's the general truth that you can't, you must have mass production in order to get goods for cheap. So keep that in mind. Before you start um, really, you know, calling everybody out in terms of the politics, this is this is a, a true uh, production line that, that exists and there's not much we can do about it unless we become a factory that can turn on time, fix themselves, we can get robotics that can change the product line by fixing each other.